Hey, what's going on? My name is Jocko Willink. I spent 20 years in the military, in the SEAL teams to be more specific. I rose up through the ranks, started off as a young enlisted guy right out of high school, ended up becoming an officer, and then retired after 20 years. Once I retired, I started helping companies with their leadership inside their organizations. And from them, from that experience, I ended up writing a bunch of books and I do a podcast called Jocko Podcast. That's me. It's cool. Sounds fun and interesting. Well, I'm, I'm Greg Zipadelli, Vice President of uh, Competition here at Stuart Haas. Um, I've been in the racing industry my entire life. And when I say that, I mean like I've done this since I was 14. Um, and the only job I've ever had was a, some form of, of, of auto racing. Grew up in New England and um, raced uh, short tracks and then moved, uh, moved south and um, crew chiefed for a bunch of years for uh, Tony Stewart, won a couple championships and then um, came over here to uh, kind of just kind of head up the program um, from more of a global perspective than, than you know, the, a weekend deal just worrying about one team. So uh, to start off, I'm, I'm going to have both of you guys define what leadership is. So Jocko, if you want to start, and then we'll, we'll cut over to Zippy. Sure. Leadership to me is you're in a position where you're trying to get a group of human beings with all their different egos and agendas and all the things that they've got going on. You're trying to get them unified behind a common plan to go and execute a mission. That's what leadership is to me. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, we use the, 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 the phrase around here of just trying to get everybody to pull on the rope in the same direction at the same time. Um, uh, it, it's, it's literally what, what, what you said is, how do I get a group um, of people uh, motivated um, to uh, basically what, whatever that task is, whether it's building a race car or whether it's a mission, right? It's, it's, it's literally the, you know, to me, the same, same thing. You, you, you have to have you need to know what each pe person needs um, and each group, you know what I mean? To me, is, is, they're all different to, like you said, the egos and, and uh, you know, their own agendas and the things of that nature. So um, it's, it's quite interesting and a lot of fun. Zippy, we'll talk about that for a second. So uh, you were crew chief for Tony Stewart when he first started in the sport. Um, and, and not saying that he had a, a specific ego, but he was, he was a bit of a, a wildfire of sorts. You know, he, he came in and he was just, there's a guns blazing. Yeah, there's a there's a difference between having an ego and being selfish, or being so passionate that you let um, you know you, you you do things that, that because you're not controlling your emotions. Um, at no point in time did I ever feel like Tony Tony might have been selfish in the, in, in the way that he treated me or we got into some of the arguments. But I, I, my personality doesn't that doesn't bother me any, and I knew that it was just because we didn't accomplish the goal that we had set out at that moment, that day, that weekend would, would, would set him off. But, um, you know, he, he would always turn around. It was never a Monday after a Sunday or Saturday that we had could have been the worst day or the worst argument that we couldn't and didn't talk and everything was behind us. And, and, and that was, I think that's what made us successful is, is we both were very passionate, but we respected each other for what we were able to do to, to you know, once we said our piece or we had our fight or the radio went flying down through the cabinet and the trailer or television got broken lounge after the conversation that we had of why we took two instead of four or whatever the case was, <clears throat> it was over and we moved on. Um, all right, Jocko, same thing for you. I mean, you uh, you get these sailors that are fresh out of, out of uh, you know, they're, they're 17, 18 years old coming in here to, to fight for the country. Um, how is it on your end when it comes to, you know, dealing with the different egos and dealing with the different personalities? Well, well one thing that just going off of, of what Greg just said, you know, you can get in an argument about what went wrong, how it happened, what we should have done. But ultimately on Monday morning, they're aligned behind what they're trying to do. They're trying to win races and they might have some different ideas of how they get it done. They might look back and debrief what went wrong. But ultimately, if they can step past that and say, listen, what we are trying to do as a team is win races, we're, we're all behind that. No one's going to say, no, I'm out there to try and lose. That's not going to happen. So it's the same thing in any organization. Sometimes you have to, I, I call it climb the ladder of alignment, because if you're at a company, you're at a business, there, there's no one in the business that wants the company to lose money. There's no one at the company that wants customers to be angry. There's no one at the company that wants 
employees to be disgruntled. We all have the same common goals. Sometimes we just have to get above our agenda and get our above our own egos to get there. And it's the same thing in a SEAL platoon. Ultimately, you've got a bunch of guys in a SEAL platoon. They want to do the right thing for the country. They want to serve their country. They might have some different ideas about how we execute a particular mission. But if we can rise above that and rise above our own egos and look for what's the best possible way to execute this mission, that's how we're going to win in the end. So for both of you guys, uh, what kind of ways do you motivate a team to get the most from them? Jocko, we'll start with you. The, the biggest thing I always did for motivation was I gave people ownership. I gave them control over their own destiny. You know, it, what we were just talking about, if, if, I was wor- if, if Greg was working for me and we had a mission to go accomplish, I wouldn't come up with a plan myself and then impose that plan on him. Instead, I'd say, Greg, here's the mission. Here's what we got accomplished. Here's what we got to get accomplished. How do you want to do it? And I'd let him come up with a plan. Now, when he has ownership of that plan, he's going to take much, he's going to have a much more motivated attitude going to attack that plan because it's something that he created. So as often as I could, as much as I could, I would try and give ownership to my subordinates, give ownership to the members of my team, let them come up with a plan so that they're executing something that they thought of. And I think that's the most powerful force you can give inside of a team. Absolutely. I, I agree wholeheartedly with that is, is giving a, a enough ownership. And, and, you know, we say, I say, you're going to have enough rope to hang yourself and you'll probably get a little bit of a yank when we feel like you're getting close. And then, you know, um, but, but it just goes back to what you said is, is, is you surround yourself with people that are capable of doing the jobs that are needed. You, you know, <clears throat> encourage when they need it, you reprimand when it's needed, and you look like from a, from a, a more of a global perspective and encourage these guys to, 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 to go do what, what, what they do. I mean, they sit there and do, whether it's a body hanger, he does it every single day, the same thing. So by me going and getting out what he wants and how he wants to do it, it's usually a better way, right? There's a, many ways to skin a cat, but at the end of the day, you're looking for efficiency, we're looking for consistency, um, and, and how do we produce the best product that, uh, that, that we can here at, at Stuart Haas? All right, so be starting with you on this one. Leading can be humbling, and you are constantly learning um, as you're leading. Is there a single defining moment that shaped you as a leader? Oh, I don't, I don't know. I think there's, there's um, especially in the sport that, uh, that, that we're in, um, I, I always say that it's a very humbling sport. Uh, you can be on top today, and, and next week something out of your control goes wrong or you know you could have had a little bit of control in it um you know whether it's a pit stop whether it's a, a part failure whether it's um just simply a, a a poor setup or a bad call um but but this this i i feel like our industry is extremely humbling um and and the best way to to, to deal with it is just you know kind of take it on the chin get up monday morning and and, and put it behind you and figure out how do you how do you learn something from it move on and, and go attack the next weekend. Is there one moment from your career, would you say that there was you know, that sense of accomplishment? Like, hey, I led this group at what, the first championship, second championship? I, I would absolutely say it was the first championship because, because that 2001 year, um, 2000, 2001 year, e- even that year with, with, with Tony, um, he hadn't really, just being honest, matured a whole lot. And there was a lot of trying moments. Um, I had people wanting to quit, people wanting to not be there any longer. Um, not wanting to work with him because of the way that, 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 that he um, acted in that moment. And some people can't look past, that's a moment. He's, 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 you know, he's racing at 200 miles an hour. His adrenaline is at a, is at a level that, that's sitting in the pit box. None of those guys are at. And, and, and you, it's really hard to put yourself in that position. It's kind of like you on a mission or jumping out of a helicopter. You know what I mean? All, all those crazy things. Is, you, unless you're there and actually understanding it, it's, I mean, sometimes it's harder for others to control their emotions, but, but their, you know, their goals were the same. Our goals were the same. Um, but, but that was a pretty trying, trying year. And it was probably one of the most rewarding um, moments of my, of, of my life or career other than my, you know, wife and children, obviously, but. Jocko, same question. Is there a single moment in your career that, that kind of defined you as a leader? 
that's that's a that's a hard statement to make. I mean, you you do a lot you do a lot of growing up inside the SEAL teams. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I went in when I was 18 years old, and there was no way you're going to turn an 18 year old punk kid into a humble leader overnight. It just wasn't going to happen. There wasn't a singular moment. But I had many many moments where you know I was faced with adversity and realized I didn't I, I wasn't as good as I thought I was. And the sooner that happened in my career, the better it was, the more impact. But I, I would say one of the things for me is I was I was doing a training mission. And during this training mission, something occurred where I had to take a step back. I, I, I forced I was forced to take a step back and actually look around and see what was happening and detach from the kind of chaos that was right in front of me. And when I did that, I realized how much I could see, how much how much better vision I had when I wasn't all caught up in the thing that was right in front of my face. And it gave me a much better perspective as to what was happening. And I, I kind of made that part of my life, just always trying to take a step back, never trying to get caught up in the details, never trying to be the guy staring down my weapon the whole time. I was always trying to take a step back and look around. And that was very, very helpful for me throughout my career. And I think what it allowed me to do is, is what Zippy just said. One of the major things it allowed me to do was see other people's perspectives you know when he's talking about when he's talking about you know a driver coming into the pits that's got been driving 200 miles an hour and his adrenaline is flying off the handle and at least having the perspective to think you know what this guy's going to be charged and if something's not working right he's going to be mad about it and we need to understand that and you can only do that if you have that ability to take a step back detach from that immediate firefight that's right in front of you and i think that was a big that was a big change in in my life as i went through and and sort of made that part of my program always trying to take a step back and never get too caught up in, in what was going on right in front of my face uh jack i'm going to start with you on this one um, adversity is bound to happen what do you do to ensure that a team gets through a difficult situation that you don't have control over? Well, first of all, you take ownership of whatever you can, right? Whatever you can, you take ownership of. And I think generally people in any team, we can take ownership of more than we think. We have more impact and more control than we think that we do. So when something goes wrong, I, my first question is, okay, what did I, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? What did I not explain to the team? What didn't I train the team on? What didn't I review with the team? Who didn't I screen to put in this position to be on the team? What do I need to do different to make sure this doesn't happen? And, and take ownership, explain to the team what I'm going to do differently to make sure that this doesn't happen again. And then I'm going to go out and implement whatever that solution is. So that's my protocol. It's pretty straightforward. Take ownership of what happened, find a solution, and then take ownership of implementing that solution so that we overcome that problem next time. Zippy, same question? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I can. I think you said it perfectly. I mean, it, it, is, it is simply taking ownership, encouraging the people around you, um, trying to lift them up to and, and you know, know that it's okay to fail. What did we learn? How do we become better? And then how do we execute it the next time to that next level, to that next height? And if it's a 1% or a 5%, depending on, you know, what, what, what that growth and, and where you're at um, is just making sure that it, that it, you know, it doesn't happen again. You, you, you encourage these guys and yourself to, uh, to own it and uh, move forward. Uh, Zippy, we'll talk real quick. Uh, talk about how your role changed from being a crew chief in charge of one team to being your role now as vice president of competition and overseeing all five teams here at Stewart House Racing. Yeah, I I completely misread um, what I was getting into. I think a little bit as as, as our, our, our as I changed roles, our industry changed um, some at the same time. Um, and you know, when I came to Stewart House, it was two teams. Then we went to three. Then we went to four. Then we had one Xfinity. Then we had two. So at one point, we had we had six teams. Um, so you're dealing with from from um, personalities, egos, attitudes, um, some good, some bad, you know, it's, it's, how do you, how do you control that? How do you harness it? How do you, how do you get them to, to, to take that and use it in a positive way? Um, but for me, it was now it's rather than leading, you know, a, a group of, of eight or 10 people on a, on a, on a daily basis. And then on a Sunday, you have your pit crew guys that come in. So, you know, that, that, that expands it, you know, that 18 to 20 mark, 
Um, and, and, you know, you get, all the, you get all the glory that day. So to me, there was a lot of um, good days and bad days. Um, you, you, you want you to take ownership, and if you had a good day, um, that it was rewarding. And if you didn't, you, how do you allow that to motivate you? Um, now, I honestly feel like we have, um, not to be negative Nancy, but it's almost like every day is a bad day because you could run one, two, three, four, and the person that's fourth wants to know why their car wasn't as fast as the guy that was first or why that pit crew didn't do as good as the other one. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very unique dynamic. There's not a lot of, um, like when you were crew chiefing and you made a call or you won a race, the adrenaline to make that call and to succeed or to get slapped right in the face because it was the wrong one, um, to me was extremely motivating. Today, it's um, there's nowhere near the intensity, but the height of the things that you deal with is, it never comes down. It's, it's a, it's a, um, a, a it's just you work on one department, then the next one, and then the next one, and, and you just keep working on the people on the group on that. So um, for me, it became, um, I really had to step back and, and be able to look at, at everything as a, as a big picture rather than, um, you know, as a crew chief, just really being selfish. And, and I, that's what I always said is I got paid for a lot of years to be selfish, worry about my car, my group, and my driver. Um, now it's 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 five teams, five drivers, five crew chiefs, five pit crews, um, the fab shop, the finish fab, the CNC, all the production, um, aviation, uh, hotel rooms, and you know all, all those things. So, um, I mean, in a nutshell, it's just a lot more headaches. Hi, Jacko. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fair. And then the last thing I'm going to ask you to do is just—I uh, know you talked about this a little bit earlier, but talk a little bit more about Echelon Front and what you guys do in, in teaching <laughs> others to be good leaders. Well, I have a company and it's called Echelon Front. And what we do is we take the lessons that we learned on the battlefield and we transmit those lessons to all different types of organizations, businesses, teams, first responders, military units, just about every industry that you can think of. We teach the, the leadership principles we learned so that they can apply those principles into whatever business they're in and they can win. Um, just, just wanted to say, I, I know that you all are honoring some of my guys from my SEAL task unit, task unit bruiser, and we deployed to Ramadi, Iraq in 2006, and, and we lost three of our, our teammates, Mark Lee, Mikey Mansoor, and Ryan Job. just three incredible SEALs, incredible human beings, incredible Americans, and it was a travesty to lose them, and it's a real honor that they will be memorialized on your car and, and people will take a look at them. And hopefully when they see those names, they'll do a little research. They'll find out a little bit more about those guys and they'll, they'll realize what true heroes are. So I appreciate you all doing that for us. Thank you. Well, Jack, I really appreciate just spending a little bit of time with you and seeing, you know, learning a little bit about um, your style and, and, and your thoughts and, and uh, you know, your background and where you came from. Um, Really do respect you and appreciate uh, you know all you you've you've given to us so that we have the freedom to actually go and race and and, and have the fun that, that that we do have. Yeah, well, I appreciate it as well. And and listen, I wish that back in the day you could have come and analyzed my team because we used to do pit crew drills on our Humvees and we'd see how fast we could get a tire change. We should figure out how fast we'd get a tow strap rigged. We used to do that because not we're so we could win a race but so we could stay alive and, and we used to do it on a clock. So appreciate it. Appreciate what y'all doing. I look forward to at some point getting out there to one of these races.